So um, like Alexi mentioned at the beginning, I'm Nick, by the way. I work with Chris. Uh, like Alexi mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, we sort of weren't prepared to talk about the product or do a demo, and so, uh, but I've sort of reluctantly agreed. Uh, so I'll try to keep it brief. I'll do a kind of a whirlwind tour in about 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about the problems that are motivating what we're doing. So uh, it's the backdrop, which a lot of this may be obvious to a lot of people in this room, but you know, uh, the world is getting more analytical. Um, and what I think that means in particular is people are realizing that the old world model of pointing a BI tool at a database and just like querying data, looking at data, querying data, looking at data, doesn't scale to more sophisticated uh, kinds of questions and kinds of work that people want to do. So when you talk about predictive models or um, much more sophisticated attribution to explain why you're seeing certain behavior, uh, you, need, you need code to answer those questions. So you need to do data science in something like Python or R or Scala. And what we observed is that a lot of organizations trying to do that work don't have the analogous infrastructure that they have for software engineering that lets them um, follow best practices, collaborate, effectively share their work, um, scale up the actual work they're doing to sort of uh, run things at, at, at scale. And so that's broadly the, the problem or the constellation of problems we're trying to address with Domino. It's sort of a platform for uh, analysis at an enterprise scale. Uh, and it can sit in, so you can deploy in the cloud, you can deploy on premise behind your firewall. Uh, and I'll go through kind of the pillars of functionality. So the first, the first thing just to kind of understand what is all happening here, um, you make projects in Domino and a project looks a lot like a Git repo. So the first thing it has is it has a bunch of files and these files get mirrored or manifest, materialized on a folder on your computer and there's a command line client to control that synchronization. One of the first things that's different about what we've done is Domino projects track large files, whereas Git will kind of fall down with about 100 megs, it, wasn't, it was designed for code. Domino will handle basically as much as your network transfer can handle. So if you're going back and forth to the cloud, typically that means 30, 40 gigs. If you're on premise, it's a lot faster. Um, and we'll keep a fully revisioned history of all your data in your project folder. Yeah? Again. So, um, so we got files. That's all pretty basic stuff. Where things get interesting is that in addition to storing files, we can run your code really easily. And so the demo I'll do uses, um, well, we can run kind of any language, but I've got a, a demo prepared in Python that I'll do because it's, it's easy. And the idea here is this uses, um, is it, I know that text is big enough. This is uh, it's using, it's a scikit-learn example. So it does some topic classification on Reuters articles. And uh, we pass in a parameter at the command line. That's the number of documents to use in our validation set. And then we generate some charts that show prediction times and training times and whatever. And the idea here is you work locally on your machine. We're not an IDE. We didn't want to be rebuilding an IDE. And you can run this particular file. And I mentioned the, the particular file takes a parameter, so I can pass that in. It's just like running Python at the command line. But instead of running it on your machine, what it does is it packages up any changes you've made. It ships it off to uh, a cluster, either our cloud cluster or a cluster behind your firewall. And it starts executing that code. And so you'll see in a second, you see this new sort of task queued up here. Um, and it's going to crank through, and it's running on whatever hardware I picked. And what's nice about this is each of these experiments we kick off runs in parallel on its own machine. So I can sort of try a couple different things at once, and we handle spreading them out around, uh, around the machines available to you. So it can, you can parallelize your model development and, and speed that up. And then what we do is we keep a record of not just the version of your code and data that ran, but also the results that, generate, that were generated. So this particular run here produced these results, which are going to be some charts that we were expecting. Um, this one that finished a second later generated some charts that will be slightly different, because they had a different parameter. Take a second to, so, um, so you know, two different versions, and we can kind of compare them. And then this is all stored centrally, so it's shareable. It makes for great reporting features. Uh, we can render arbitrary HTML if you generate, you know, things that include widgets or whatever. 
So that's, um, that's kind of how we think about version control and this iterative experimental workflow where you run something and you want a record of what you did and the results it produced and you want to see that, that revision history over time. And what we kind of we're working on now, you saw it, Chris, so you can start up, you can run notebooks on, uh, on the remote hardware as well and we'll keep records of what you do there and we just added the Scala notebook support. Um, I was also going to show running Scala code as scripts, um, which is just, uh, just have this in dev right now. It'll get released at some point, but the, the simple example I'll show you. Uh, we just generate a random number and print something out. So this is, real, this is a really early proof of concept. But the idea here is I can run that Scala code And uh, it enqueues it on the server and runs it there. And and there's there's our output. So the final thing I wanted to show about this is what I like to think of is like the end of an analytics project life cycle where you've developed something and you want to actually integrate it into your business process. Typically you want to deploy it in some way so that existing software systems or, or automated workflows can use it. Um, and our approach to doing that, because we've already got your code stored centrally and we've got the ability to run arbitrary code on scalable machines. So what we've done is we've added the ability to expose your code as a web service. Um, and I'll show you an example here. So right now we can do this in R or Python, and the problem we see a lot is people build predictive model, data scientists build predictive models in one of these languages, and software engineers need to consume them in a general purpose language for their application that could be Scala or Java or .NET or Ruby or whatever. And that communication, either there's some painful work to translate the model or there's organizational friction involved in getting the dev team to actually do the work to integrate the data science model. So we think web services are a really nice layer to act as an interface between the two. Um, the way this works is you specify a file and a function in that file. I'll, I'll do one in Python here. And so this code in my project uses a um, sort of a, a classifier that I've already trained and I've just saved as a pickle file. And so we can train this on our large machines for running longer running tasks. And then a you know, predict function just uses that to call predict on the features that I pass into this function. So I specify those two things, I hit publish, and that basically stands up an in-memory Python process uh, on a web server. Um, it runs any initialization code, and it sits around and waits for incoming HTTP requests. When those come in, it'll pull the parameters out of the request, it'll pass them into the function you specified, and run your code and return the results as JSON. Um, and it does this nice thing, nice thing where it won't switch over to your new release until, you, uh, until it's fully ready and initialized. Um, this is all tied into version control as well, so you get the history of the releases you've done. So we've published that, and we can uh, just kind of show you that it works. This uses a, um, the model I've, I've deployed here predicts wine quality from some chemical features like pH and residual sugar. So that's the endpoint I'm going to hit. I pass in a feature vector and um, that runs. We've designed this to be very low latency to work in sort of uh, real time production settings and return some metadata, but the real interesting thing I care about is the result that my code calculated. Um, and that's, that's the basic idea. So, um, so language agnostic kind of run scale, track, share, and, and deploy work designed uh, around data science workflows. And um, up to now, we've mainly focused on R, Python, some MATLAB, but uh, increasingly hearing more interest in Scala, so working in that direction. Um, yeah, so the, I think the question is basically, what's the advantage of um, d this, this last feature I showed, this API endpoint, sort of deploying your models as R or Python? Yeah. 
Is that like yeah. what what what? Well, I guess uh, what you said was for this is a place where developers uh, can interface with data scientists. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, does this environment translate code, or is it? No, no. It, no, it puts a web service interface in front of the code. So okay. a software engineer, say say you're working on an application in Java or C sharp or whatever. Um, uh, instead of having to translate code from Python, you can just call a web service. So this web service becomes a nice, clean interface. And then behind that interface, your data scientists can update models. They can change the underlying implementation. They can deploy updates whenever they want. So it's removing a bottleneck. Uh, it's, it's sort of freeing up data scientists to deploy their models without having to go through software engineers. So you're saying that uh, the data scientists Python code would directly go into production? Right, yeah. As long as, like, the, so the software engineering team writes once, something that hits a web service. Right, and then that's the, the interfaces in place. Any other questions? Yeah? How are you supposed to interface with the function that you're supposed to? How is that um, So uh, when you make your HTTP request, there are, you have um, uh, post parameters. <coughs> and we pass those into your function as positional arguments. Um, so if you pass three parameters in your post request, those get passed in as the first, second, third arguments to your function. How do I know that's the interface? Well, that's part of the interface you're agreeing upon, I guess. I mean, or maybe I'm not sure I follow. Maybe. Um, that's right. Yeah, it's not enforced syntactically. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a HTTP request. So I don't, yeah. All right, thanks, guys.